Welcome back to The Phone Booth. I'm your host, Joe Pollard. If you would like to support the show, become a patron at www.patreon.com slash foolsgallery. We have a few amazing new rewards for our patrons, my favorite being exclusive access to a secret full-length episode of The Phone Booth. We understand that this is a financially trying time for all of us, so only give what you can. The following episode was the email that convinced me to go ahead with this second season. I was contacted out of the blue by a woman named Alice Kessler. Though my first thought was to ignore the email, I couldn't help but glance at it. An hour later, I had finished my third read-through and knew I had to tell Alice's story. To better represent the spirit of Alice Kessler, the following episode will be read by friend of the pod, Elizabeth Seeley. And now, without further ado, episode three of The Phone Booth, Safe Space. Dear Mr. Pollard, my name is Alice Kessler, and I haven't spoken to anyone since the quarantine began. I must admit, there was a time in my life when this situation would have sounded like paradise to me. I've never liked interacting with people all that much. I always feel like they're judging me, or I was offending them. I just... I don't know. Have you ever been embarrassed by every syllable you've spoken in a conversation? That's my entire life, and I've spent most of that life trying to avoid people. But with this quarantine, there's something about not having the option of interaction that makes me crave it. I need to talk to somebody, but a lifetime of self-isolation hasn't left me with a lot of friends, if any at all. I don't talk to my parents, and I have no siblings, but I do listen to your podcast, and I feel like I can talk to you. God, I sound creepy. I promise I'm not a stalker. It's just that there's a certain intimacy in podcasts, don't you think? I guess it's intimacy I've been missing. So, anyway, I've decided to write to you. I've decided that since you were brave enough to tell me your story, it seems only fair that I tell you mine. Now, I don't expect you to respond, and I half expect you to delete this email the moment you get it. But I need to talk to someone. And writing to you is making me feel better. You don't have to respond, but I hope you do. Because I could really use the company. So this is my story. It isn't anything special. It won't pick you up or blow you down. But it's mine. So here goes. My name is Alice Kessler and I suffer from acute social anxiety disorder. I don't know when it started, but I know I wasn't always this way. My mother has an old VHS tape of my fifth birthday where I was throwing cow pies at my gaggle of friends. She loves to dust off the old machine, pop that baby in and say, what happened? You used to be so happy. Well, I don't know what happened. Puberty, probably. High school, most definitely. But I don't have a reason why I can't talk to people. I just can't. Sometimes I wish there was a reason. Sometimes I wish a family member had died so that the rest of the world would say, yeah, that's Alice. She's weird, but her mother died when she was young, so I wish they said that. Instead of, Yeah, that's Alice. She's weird. Is that horrible? I know. I'm horrible. I didn't have friends in high school or college. It was easier not to speak. Easier to convince myself I had nothing to say. And even if I did, no one would want to listen. I graduated mostly by default and immediately went about designing my perfect life. I was able to leverage my art school degree into a few graphic design jobs that I could do remotely. They didn't pay much, but they didn't have to. I didn't intend on paying rent. My uncle had just moved to Italy with his 21-year-old girlfriend and needed a house sitter for his basement apartment in Chicago. I moved in the day after graduation. 
I stocked the cabinets with non-perishables, filled every inch of the place with books and movies, and cleared a body-length rectangle on the floor for my yoga mat. In just a few days, I created a life where I could be happily, blissfully, alone. And I was. For 14 months, I didn't see another soul. My only company was the disembodied feet that walked past my window and the cute pizza guy who delivered four pizzas every two weeks. My days quickly fell into one unending routine. Wake up, breakfast, jumping jacks, masturbate, shower, work, lunch, yoga, read, masturbate, dinner, movie. That sound familiar? Yeah, that's right. I figured out the perfect quarantine day long before it was cool. And for a time, it was paradise. But it wasn't meant to last. Something always seems to get in the way of a good thing. And in my case, it was Becca Orlovsky. But regardless of Becca, B-Day was going to be a special day for me. Because B-Day fell on pizza day. Four fresh-out-of-the-oven pepperoni and anchovy pizzas delivered right to my doorstep by the same cute delivery guy. His name was Devin, and I've never been able to decide whether he was actually attractive or just that I had no one else to compare him to. I had exhausted all my porn and had been relying on Devin's bi-weekly visits to fan my fantasies. I knew I would never act on these impulses, but that was part of what made it so exciting. I spent the whole day preparing. I cleaned every inch of the apartment that was in line of sight of the door, leaving giant piles of trash hiding behind walls and dividers. I dressed casual, in a cute flowery skirt and a nice red top, not too low cut, but enough to make him think I was a girl who went out every few months. But just a few minutes before Devin arrived, I would get nervous and change out of the skirt and top and into jeans and a sweatshirt. <laughs> this last minute change was just another part of the routine. I look back on it now and shudder. <laughs> to him, he was just delivering another pizza. But to me, pizza day was bigger than all the other holidays combined. I thought about it constantly, planning out intricate scenarios that always ended with him pushing me up against the wall and pressing his lips against mine. But all that ever happened was he would knock on my door, I would answer, he would look up and say, Alice? I would say, yes, thank you. Then I would sign the receipt and he would leave. That's it. Every time. As predictable as breakfast. There was one change about six months in, however. I had lost my pen, so I had to use his. He handed it to me, and as I took it, our fingers touched just a little. I made sure to never find my lost pen. I know what this sounds like. I know you must think me pathetic, cowardly, and maybe a little creepy. You think, why not just talk to him? Why not go outside, interact with the real world? What were you so scared of? But here's the truth. Most of the time, I wasn't scared. I wasn't sad. I wasn't even lonely. I was happy, blissful even. I like being alone. When I'm alone, I feel confident, beautiful, competent, it's only when someone's looking at me that my self-doubt and hatred come swarming back. I like being alone. I just can never be completely alone. Everybody needs somebody, and I didn't realize that until I'd cut everyone out of my life. The knock came two minutes before Becca changed the world. I dried my hands on my pants, took a deep breath, counted to ten, and opened the door. How are you doing, Alice? Devin said. 
I began to mention I hadn't found my pen, but was interrupted when he held out his expectantly. You keep this one. On me, he said, smiling. I reached out to take it, and our fingers brushed together at the exact moment the cascade hit us. It exploded through my window, knocking me forward and straight into Devon. He dropped the pizzas, catching me as we fell to the floor. Glass and ceiling tile crashed down, but for some reason left us untouched. I remember a shard of glass falling directly toward my face, only to shatter on the empty air. But it wasn't empty. It began to shimmer and solidify. I reached out to touch it and found an opaque wall that allowed nothing in and nothing out. It was a force field. It was my force field. And it was expanding. Forming a perfect circle around us, it ballooned outwards, pushing away everything that wasn't Devin and me. It crushed the pizzas, the doorway, the trash in my apartment, and then the apartment itself. I didn't know how to stop it. It pushed its way into the foundations of the building, splintering its supports. My ceiling sagged, then gave way, and I looked up just in time to see 20 floors of steel, homes, and people crash down on our heads, plunging us into absolute darkness. At first, I didn't realize what had happened. One second, I was failing at flirting, and the next, I was trapped underneath several tons of rubble. The only thing keeping us alive was the very thing trapping us there in the first place. The force field stopped expanding when the building came down, forming a perfect, impenetrable bubble, keeping everything out and me in. It was kind of what I always wanted. But I wasn't alone. Devin was there. For some reason, my bubble hadn't pushed him away. For some reason, it let him stay. The one solace was in the darkness. At least he couldn't see me. But I could hear him crying. We both knew we were going to die in there. I was just the only one who wished she was alone for it. For the first few hours, Devin tried to speak to me. I did my best to ignore him hoping the darkness coupled with the silence would be enough to dissuade conversation. I felt bad for Devin. Of all the people he had to spend the last moments of his life with, it had to be me. I almost felt like apologizing, but it was easier to stay silent. The darkness gave me anonymity, which gave me safety. But then Devin said, I can see you. My stomach dropped. He could see me in the dark. All of me, and I couldn't hide anymore. My chest tightened. I couldn't breathe. My head spun. I felt like I was going to die. But before I could, Devin collapsed. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him. He was weeping. His breaths came in tiny, ragged gasps. He cried out, pleading with me to speak to him, telling me he didn't want to die. I didn't know what to do. I was all too familiar with panic attacks, but I had never seen them in someone else. Strangely, his fear calmed me, smoothing over my dread and replacing it with... not confidence, never confidence but something close to certainty. In the dark, I edged closer to him, my hand outstretched to keep me from bumping into the wall. Then my hand touched his hair. He was trembling like a leaf, but he did not shy away from me. Carefully, gently, I knelt down and wrapped my arms around his shaking body. He clutched himself to me, It was so strange. I knew exactly what he was feeling. I had been in his position many times before. I began to speak. 
I knew the words didn't matter. They would fade into the darkness like everything else, but I knew it was the sound of my voice. It was the fact that I was there, speaking to him, that would help. My voice became his anchor. I became his anchor. And I couldn't help but notice his hands on my back, hugging our bodies tightly together. I tried to ignore it, but we were so close. I could feel his breath on my neck and then his lips on mine. I jumped away, stumbling in the dark. He had kissed me. My brain seemed to have short-circuited. Uncountable fantasies were coming true. And my first thought was to run back to my side of the bubble and die in peace. Please, he said. I just don't want to be alone. And after a long moment, I realized I didn't want to be either. I inched towards him. Our trembling hands met and interlaced. I looked up in the darkness and saw nothing. I felt exposed. He could see me, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter that we barely knew each other. It didn't matter that without food and water we would both be dead in a few days. All that mattered was he was another person, and he was there. I kissed him. I never felt so confident in all my life. My entire body was vibrating. But then I realized so was his. The vibration wasn't coming from us. It was coming from the force field. It was expanding, pushing the rubble up and away. A sharp beam of light cut through the darkness, blinding us. When it cleared, the force field had expanded so far it had pushed the collapsed building completely aside. The force field dissipated. We were free to go. I looked up at Devon. He smiled awkwardly. I tried to hide my face. It was as if my confidence had only existed inside the bubble, inside my little world. But now it was gone, and fear took its place. I just wanted the force field to come back. I needed to block out the real world. Devin thought he understood. The world had transformed. It had become a nightmare. But to me... It hadn't changed all that much. It was still just as terrifying, loud, and daunting. Only now with more burning buildings. Devin and I stayed together for the next few months. We found an abandoned apartment and holed up there until the world put itself back together. But then, Devin wanted to go out. And I wanted to stay in. And we broke up. But that's all right. I learned my lesson. It's okay to be alone, but never completely alone. I became a yoga instructor, renting out my own little world, one student at a time. I make a real living off it. My bubble is clean and quiet, an escape from the larger world that is increasingly loud and overwhelming. People need a safe space. I give them that safety, and they give me connection. For only a little while. I hope you have that connection in your life. All the best, Alice.
This has been a Fool's Gallery production of The Phone Booth. Safe Space was written and directed by Keenan Ellis and performed by Elizabeth Seeley.